This is another episode of As the Portal Churns. Actually, it's the Pick 6 podcast. With the Omaha World Herald, I'm Evan Bland, Sam McEwen, Jimmy Watkins coming to you on a active, busy, behind-the-scenes sort of time in college football with the transfer portal. There's basketball being played at differ, different levels from the men and the women of Nebraska. We'll get into that, too. Um, but it's, it's been a busy off-season stretch. Are you guys staying warm today? I think the high is like eight single digits. I actually wore a pair of pajama pants over the khaki pants that I'm wearing right now on my way into the office oh, and wow. was sort of like didn't realize it until I, w- I, I was I meant to take them off before I left my car, but I walked up to the World Herald building with them still on. So I smuggled them into my coat as I walked in and they're laying on my desk right now as we speak. You could have worn them all the way in. Yeah, I know. I've, and I've done that before at, at previous workplaces. Just like we got to, I feel like you got to ease into that sort of behavior. Sure. <laughs> um, and yeah, they're also, they're ACDC. And this is a big, this is a big office. Too, it is. So it's I true. Think. And I don't come in here very often. Yeah. So I don't want, if, if some, it's very possible for someone to run into me and that be their only impression of me. Oh, man. And I don't want that. Happy New Year, Evan. Happy New Happy Year, Happy birthday. Evan. Thank you. When was your birthday? My birthday was uh, earlier this week. Damn. The big Should've three texted. six. Yeah, hard to believe, but. Well, you got to be Facebook friends. That's how you learn these That's things. That's true. I have to collect. I'm the uh, I'm the sports editor now here. I'm, I have to now collect everyone's birthday, and then we'll have a birthday cake or a pie or a cobbler on the day. If, and we're not going to have that, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll acknowledge everyone's birthday because I haven't, I haven't done that yet. But uh, happy birthday. Happy New Year. This is the first podcast we've had in the new year. You won, right. the, you won the picks competition. Was final there a final, slide, was there a right? final yeah. margin there? Well, we still got a national title game that we can pick again if okay. we want. And I was winning until my my little parlay of failure <laughs> uh, with, uh, with Michigan, Cincinnati, Iowa. Uh, I picked Utah, and they lost. Uh, right. And then uh, Penn State. I got them all wrong. So You were beating Evan? Until that happened? Until I, well, I wasn't beating him for oh, the okay. whole season. I was okay. winning the Bulls. Oh, okay. no yeah, I was doing quite well up until then. Hmm. And then in the tide turn, I thought for sure I'd get Utah, Ohio State. Nope. Ohio That's State's got game. too many good receivers. and great great game. Game. Got a good quarterback. And Speaking of quarterbacks. I still won't forget that when Nebraska played Ohio State, and I believe it was Garrett Wilson who didn't play that game, and Evan and I were looking over like their depth chart, and it was like, oh, we might, we might see Marvin Harrison Jr. today. Yeah. It's just yeah. ridiculous. Just the other four or five stars they've ridiculous. got. They're in special the guys. But, yeah, no, there's no doubt uh, the, the topic du jour remains, as it has for weeks, quarterback recruiting in the portal. And uh, as we've seen, Nebraska's had its, its sights set on a number of different quarterbacks, but this one looks a little bit more... Um, uh, certain, I suppose, that, that uh, Casey Thompson, the former Texas quarterback uh, and, and Nebraska, as, as of this moment, uh, it's nothing's official, but it sure looks like as you see some of the dominoes fall with some of his other suitors that Nebraska and he could could come together. Um, I, I, let's, let's talk about him a little bit, Sam. I mean, you've, you've do done some, some, I guess, scout work on him or some film study. Mm-hmm. Well, what stands out about him and what could he bring to Nebraska? First of all, I think, you know, whenever I watch coaches oftentimes or players, I'll, I'll go back and just look through their interviews too and just see how they are with the media. And Casey Thompson's an A-plus. I mean, he's really, really good. Uh, he's His uh, dad is Charles Thompson. For people who remember that, Charles Thompson was the starting quarterback in the 87 game of the century too uh, when Oklahoma beat Nebraska, and then he was the starting quarterback against Nebraska in 88 when he broke his leg. That was the last game he played at OU. He's had he had an, a history after that, which we'll get into at some other time. But Casey Thompson uh, played four seasons at, at Texas. He redshirted one, was a backup for two, and then in year four he lost the starting job at the start of the season to Hudson Card, then won it from Card after uh, Card struggled against Arkansas, um, and then he got a little banged up. He sprained his thumb, his throwing hand thumb, um, but he still threw for about twenty one hundred yards, twenty four touchdowns. Good, good thrower of the ball. Uh, you know, threw touchdowns. I put a high priority and a high premium on touchdown passes. I think that's important. And he throws those. He's good at that. Um, and so, uh, not a big guy. His dad isn't a big guy. His dad was, you know, like a lot of option quarterbacks, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, Casey is not. He's six foot, six one, um, about 190 pounds. Not a big guy. Uh, works the pocket pretty darn well. Uh, throws the ball fairly well. 
uh, tailed off toward the end of the year when he got hurt his thumb and it kept hurting. And so I think he got pulled in the Iowa State game. He just didn't look very good and then came back against K-State. Um, so there's things about Thompson that I think anybody would like. His intangibles are pretty good. Um, he throws the football well. Um, he works the pocket. He's not necessarily looking to dive out of it uh, or bail it. Um, I thought Martinez got better at that. Adrian Martinez got better at that this year. But then as the year went on, he kind of went back to the, I'm going to scramble around and do the thing. So um, I think Thompson does a pretty good job of that. He's not the tallest guy in the world, um, but that's that's something you're going to live with. Nebraska went looking for some other guys, I think, in the portal. Obviously, Keaton Slovis uh, was one of them. Miles uh, Brennan. Miles Brennan. Uh, they went for some some taller guys, and they still want to get Chubba Purdy. You talk to his dad. Um, Purdy is number one, uh, or Purdy has Nebraska at the number one on the list. If Nebraska goes and gets Casey Thompson, which I think there's a very good chance they can, Purdy's going to have to decide. Does he want to come and, and potentially sit for a year um, while this other guy plays? Um, because I'm guessing that Chubba Purdy is transferring to another school so that he can play football there not so that he can become the understudy of someone else. And so um, we'll see. Maybe they, I know they'd love to get two. I'll be curious to see if they can get two. Uh, if they get two, they will have five plus a walk-on. The walk-on is Mikey Pauley, who is uh, a Nebraska baseball player and uh, was a damn good high school quarterback. I mean, not just good, the best in the state of Kansas. Mm-hmm. And there is, I think, a, a real heart for him. He wants to play. And he's going to be on a baseball scholarship initially. But I think uh, so they will have six legitimate quarterbacks in that room um, if, if they get five. If they if, if, if they get the two guys and then they have Harburg, Smothers, Torres, and then Pauly, who and I think is going to go and through. And all of those except Pauly would, would be here this spring. Pauly's right. coming in the summer, so everyone else – is on campus and ready to roll. I think he intends to go through fall football, though. Paulie does yeah, and right. all that. Now, he's obviously not going to be in spring because he'll be playing baseball. But um, So the quarterback room is set to change uh, significantly, I think. Um, I think you have to have a quarterback who, who, can, who, can, who has some mobility but has the ability to throw the ball downfield but is also pretty good underneath. And if there's something that Nebraska struggled with, it was if the, if the deep throw wasn't there – um, reverting down, checking down, seeing the field of vision, having good, whatever you want to call it, field of vision, and making the, the quick, accurate throw underneath. It's very possible that Nebraska wins two more games against Michigan and Ohio State if Adrian Martinez is able to hit a crossing pattern against Levi Falk, to Levi Falk. Hmm. If he hits those passes against pressure, Nebraska may win both of those games. But he didn't, and they didn't. The thing that stands out to me about Thompson is the experience piece. I mean, he started 10 games last year, 19 games that he's appeared in his in his college career, and you you know, you, you look at that with the backdrop of what Nebraska has back where Logan Smothers has been in the system a couple of years, one career start in that last game against Iowa. Heinrich right. Harburg, new to the system, Richard Torres will be in, new to the system, and then Chubba Purdy still has four years to play four. He's been a reserve at Florida State, hasn't really been in a big game as the guy yet either. And so I think when you look at what 2022 is for Nebraska, which is pretty clearly a make or break year for Scott Frost, you got to make a bowl game, you got to win now, show signs of progress. Yeah, I mean, obviously you want a good quarterback to be that guy, but I think there's a sense, at least a little bit more uh, sense of security knowing that that guy's done it before. If you're going to hitch your wagon to somebody that allows you to keep your job and move this thing forward the way they think they can, Thompson is more of a sure thing, or at least a known commodity, than what el- whatever else they have in that room. Known, com- known commodity is the exact phrase that was bouncing around in my head. Just someone where you can pick at his tape and say, okay, he can do this for us. And okay, there's, that's sort of similar to this thing that we run. Let's try to incorporate that into what we do. Or, or this, isn't, uh, this is something that we haven't really thought about doing. Maybe we should incorporate something that you can build around, something that you can tailor to, right? That's so important. Where if you're, if you're le- left with Chuppa Purdy, who's talented, highly touted uh, dual threat QB coming out of high school, and Logan Smothers, who, as we know, can run and, and looked pretty good for a while against against Iowa you just it's too many mystery boxes too many question marks you can't you can't go forward like Evan said in a, in a season where so much is on the line like that and to Sam's point about the uh, the interview stuff 
it's not just that he's he's good in that setting. He's good in that setting under that microscope, right? Like Texas good is point. one of few college programs right. in the Very country that compares to Nebraska. I would say Nebraska is probably even still a little bit tighter of a, of a microscope because there's more going on around the, the Texas Austin sports scene. But that's a program where the fan base is crazy rabid that's and, and cares. Their identity is wrapped up in the success of the football program, much like it is at Nebraska. So he, none of that will be foreign to him. And that's super important. as that's well. That's a great point. Yeah. The, 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 you know, there's, there's big games every week and he's, he's worked through a coach getting fired, the guy that recruited him and Tom Herman. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Hmm. So I, I, I suppose if that is how it shakes out for Nebraska, then, I mean, what? What are you looking for this spring? I mean, the, it, this is the the competition starts to play out. Is it Casey Thompson's job to lose if it plays out that way? Can it end in any other sort of conclusion other than it's him as the guy this fall? Should he arrive? Uh, barring yeah, barring health, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you're bringing in an older guy because you intend to have that older guy kind of assume the assume the role. Um, Thompson sprained his thumb, so he. After the Kansas State game, he said he wasn't going to throw for a month. So obviously, he's got to get healthy there and be all the way there. But yeah, I mean, I think you're looking at a situation where he's given every opportunity to to assume it. Uh, Logan Smothers, I don't think he's going to go away. I think I think Smothers uh, has potential. Um, I think Whipple will at least give him a spring. Um, and then Harburg and Torres, you know, I think those two guys, if they're smart, they're gonna they they know that that they're competing against one another. And both of them have an immense amount of potential, but not right now. And then the big question mark is, okay, if they get Thompson, do they also get Purdy? Mm -hmm. Because Purdy, again, does he really want to wait that long? His dad is very seasoned, right? His dad is Brock Purdy's dad. So he's been around Mm -hmm. the block. Right. These guys know what they're doing. Um, Based on your interview with him yesterday, a very good story. Nobody else has talked to him uh, they're the Purdy's father. What do you think? Do you, do you think that that, when you talked to him, did you get the sense that he was taking into account that Nebraska was going to take somebody else and that he still wanted to go to Nebraska? Yeah, I did. I, I think that's probably still the most likely scenario because, again, Thompson technically has two years of eligibility left. Maybe he, he leaves after one. Purdy still has four years to go. And I, I think the, the, the real strong selling point for that family, the Purdy family, was – do they have a coach there that they trust? And Mark Whipple very clearly is that guy for them. He was that guy for them when he was at Pitt. He recruited him out of high school. They they feel comfortable with how he's developed players before. And so they they said, you know, yeah, it's the school, but it's how comfortable we feel with the coach. And and they be, they believe that he can go there and and thrive under in that system under Whipple. So yeah, I absolutely still think that's the case that that they could land both um, because it's not. You know, I think Purdy's 20. I mean, he's been in college for a couple of years, but he still has a lot of eligibility. Right. So it's, it's sort of on the other end of the, the spectrum there. I, the other thing that's interesting to me, though, is, you know, it, we, we almost talk about guys like Logan Smothers and Heinrich Harburg like they were like these quarterbacks recruited to a different system when it's only kind of partially true. Like the head coach is still there, the guy that believed in them to offer them the scholarship. But yet the offensive coordinator who's new has such a different – system more of that pro style attack that it's this weird sort of mix of like guys who are recruited for one system and guys who are recruited for another but yet again still under the umbrella of the same head coach it's a really unique sort of climate that nebraska is in right now i agree with that the 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 other thing about purdy is that he's basically waiting until the last possible moment so what what part of me wonders if like he's just gonna wait if it doesn't if nebraska is not the spot if he's just gonna wait for three more months and transfer somewhere in the summer because you're running out of time, and a lot of a lot of the other guys have landed. Like, um, you know, Auburn got a quarterback today, and Indiana got a quarterback. Well, school's starting next week for a lot of these places, so you you don't have time to to go to a lot of other schools. And so I, I get the sense that he must be very very high on Nebraska because, you know, he's not visiting these other places. And the way that the rules written in the in the book, people think that you can't make a visit somewhere until January thirteenth. That's not accurate. You can make a visit to a place seven days before their school semester begins. That's the caveat to the rule. So Auburn has a, has a starts on January 12th. You can make a visit there now. 
Um, there are other schools that Purdy could have gone to that he clearly hasn't gone to um, that he could be visiting this weekend. So maybe we'll find out this weekend that he's going somewhere else. But the way it looks right now, Purdy's in, and Thompson, out of his top five, he's either going to go be, you know, he's either going to go compete against Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma or he's going to go to Nebraska. Right. That's it. Like, do I think he could beat out Dylan Gabriel? Actually, I do. Actually, yes, I do. I think that's entirely possible. But the sure thing seems like Nebraska. Oh, yeah, the clearer path to playing time would be in Lincoln, yeah, no doubt. There's also, I mean, Oklahoma has, everything's new over there, right, where you you don't know that the track record that Oklahoma had with quarterbacks before doesn't exist anymore, and Mark Whipple just did a, a thing with Kenny Pickett where he did a one year makeover Kenny Pickett's now first round NFL right. talent and I mean, right. I don't, I'm not saying that Casey Thompson can can flip that same thing but that I think you know in his in the in I don't think that's not in the back of his mind either right, right. like that's that's part of the equation here the other thing when we were talking about Evan's story um, about the Purdy family two things real quick number one the Chubba nickname that came because he was just an enormous baby he's like 30 pounds of baby incredible uh, number two to the Whipple trust point is how seamlessly we went from Whipple's recruiting Chubba Purdy super hard to come to Pitt and then just, oh, yeah, I'm not with Pitt anymore. Just like the way he phrased that um, in your story. Yeah, he said he just wasn't with Pittsburgh anymore, but that doesn't didn't seem like that disrupted anything whatsoever, and the conversation remained just as engaged as it was before. I, I think that supports your point that the Purdy family has built something real strong there with Whipple. So. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing, as we've been sort of mentioning here, um, with Purdy kind of running out of options, not only timeline-wise, but they're in, like Nebraska's biggest uh, advantage was always playing time. And if you grab another guy, obviously that that withers a little bit. But where else are you going? Like, there's no that's right. There's no there's no other free pass to playing time. The portal's clear tight, path man. to p- playing time anymore. So he's limited with time and options at this point that's right i think the other thing worth noting too is like it's a one-time free transfer so like these guys that are transferring i think there's sort of this temptation externally to be like well you know let's go somewhere else next year but it's it's a one-time deal and so I, and i've talked to a number of these transfers in other positions now too who have said as much like they realize hey you know maybe circumstances changed with my original school maybe the way that i'm evaluating schools has changed as i've matured but now you know, it's come down to this last transfer, and I better get it right. And so I, I, I think, you know, if they do choose, if the Purdy family and Chubba choose Nebraska, it will absolutely be based on that relationship because, again, they're putting their stock in this. He, he doesn't have a chance to jump ship in another year or two if things don't go how he wants it to go. So I, I, I think, you know, again, this is something that they're putting a lot of thought into, and if he ends up there, they really believe – that Mark Whipple can develop him into what he can that's, be. That's sort of the bad faith argument about transfer, the transfer portal thing too, right? Is like, oh man, everything's just going to be helter skelter, and we're going to lose all these traditions and the connections that people build don't mean anything anymore. It's, like, it's not really, it's not really true. You can, you still there is still like you're locked in to a certain degree at a certain place. Yes, you get one chance to do it, but you can't just. It's it's not how it's portrayed where everyone's just like, oh, I got passed up on the depth chart. I'm gone now. That's not that's not how it works. I want to stay on the interstate here, but. Just one point. My biggest concern about the portal is that coaches are using it to run off players. And there's literally hundreds, maybe a thousand kids caught in the portal. And they can't go anywhere else because there's, unless you have a hundred scholarships on a team, how are you going to do it? And so my concern isn't so much that like kids are jumping. They are, but you know, it's a free country. What I think's happening is, well, here's the portal. There you go. You're free. And the to kids use go it. there and, and, and it's like Phil Darius Payne went in and he came right back out. Like there's just not there's not the options that people think there are. They those options tighten up really, really fast. And unless the market corrects and teams start saying, We're only gonna sign fifteen high school kids because we're gonna save this many spots for the portal, so long as they keep drafting the same number of kids out of high school, there's gonna be thousands of kids in the portal that don't get good homes mm. for college. Let's uh let's talk about the coaching side of it. I mean, sure. Nebraska hasn't had a running backs coach officially full time for about almost two months now. Yeah, uh, the, the special teams piece remains officially uh, un unresolved. Kind of maybe lay out where where is Nebraska and that. Where do you expect that thing to go? Well, you know, Tony Tuioti went to Oregon. 
Um, I think that's going to be a good fit for him, uh, especially in recruiting. When he left, it, it did make things a little bit more clear and um, you know, clear path for Nebraska to resolve all of its all of, all of the desires it had. You can take Mike Dawson and move him down to the defensive line position, where he basically coaches two down linemen and the two outside linebackers he was already coaching. So he was already working with Tuioti, and then you have Bill Bush, who you can move into a special teams coordinator role, um, and he can also do something else. Um, the advantage you get with Bush is a they got their kicker and punter already. And it was really a joy to talk to Brian Buschini, uh, Buschini and I, I, I'm looking forward to talking to Timmy Bleak Road soon. Um, so they got a kicker and punter. That, that'll help. And then, you know, he can also go out and recruit, and he's a good recruiter. He always has been. He, you know, he got Prince of Mukamara and those guys back in the, the Callahan era. And then you have the running backs coach. Well, you, don't, you no longer have to have a running backs coach who also coaches special teams. One of the reasons I think Greg Knox was at the top of the list is because he did both of those things at Florida. Contrary to what you might have read on message boards or heard somewhere, Greg Knox's special teams were actually pretty darn good. He, they were. They were good at Florida. They were pretty darn good at Mississippi State. Certainly better than anything Nebraska's been offering since Scott Frost got there. Um, I wouldn't describe him as a great recruiter. I think he develops players when they get there, and he developed the guys that were already at Florida. I wouldn't describe him as a guy that's going to go out and get you the five-star. That's not who he was. He was the associate head coach. Like he is a he is like a he's a really solid number two or number three on a coaching staff. He was Dan Mullen's right hand man for however many years. So that's kind of who Knox is. And then they've got so he's out there. Brian Applewhite from TCU is out there. The thing you like about Applewhite is that you can kind of sense based on his history that if he goes somewhere, he'll stay there. He was at, you know, Colorado State for five, ULM for five, Wyoming for six. He did help land a five-star recruit in Zach Evans, who's now going to Mississippi. That's a good one. I, I, that's an interesting choice. I think he's in the mix. Um, there's a there's a couple guys that you know, like a guy that used to work with Bill Bush, Jafar Williams. He's out there. He's coached receivers and running backs. And then I suspect there's an NFL option or two, um, where and their season won't end until Sunday because they have 17 games now. So I think. I think that's going to be resolved by, by either tomorrow or by Monday or Tuesday. I think Nebraska kind of knows what direction they're going. And starting January 11th, I think they can start having guys on campus, and then I think they can start their evaluation on January 14th. So I think everything's going to be in place. The question is how much is everybody going to make? Do some of the defensive coaches, i.e. Eric Chenander, get a raise? Uh, does Dawson get a raise? What does Bush make? I don't know if he had a three-year contract at LSU or not, but what does he make? What does a running backs coach make? What does, you know, those those will be the questions because all the financial piece has to fit. No more three-year contracts. There won't be any three-year contracts at Nebraska, and Nebraska's running a tight tighter ship. Uh, so that's kind of where it's at with coaching. I think they're going to land okay. Um, I suppose Ron Brown is still an option at running back. You know, Ron's not going to be expensive. Because he's already here and he loves the place, and he's not going to. That's the say, people's choice. People call in on the coach's radio show right. once a week and and cape for Ron Brown. Well, there's no <laughs> question that Ron Brown is 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 an excellent position coach. There's no doubt about that. You know, he's he's a good developer. He's got good drills. He coaches passion, fire, toughness. I thought Nebraska's running backs played better in the last two games, even though Ramir Johnson, I don't think, was available. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so there's no question about that. The question is long term. And then recruiting. Like, what is that what he – it's not – I don't know. I wouldn't describe it as a passion of his. Uh, maybe it is now. But did, he didn't really land Rex Burkhead. That was Tim Beck. Uh, Amir Abdullah, he did. But that was Tim Beck. T- Tim Beck was a hell of a recruiter. And so he did some of it with, with them. But it was also, uh, you know, Beck had a lot to do with both of those guys. You know, the guys that Ron recruited were were Mikhail Wilbon and Terrell Newby. And help me out. Who am I missing? Who am I forgetting? Adam Taylor, who was, you know, he got hurt, and that wasn't his fault. But I wouldn't describe the guys that Coach Brown recruited as as good as Rex Burkhead and Amir Abdullah. Yeah, he's been more of a developer of talent yeah. than a, a, an ac- acquirer of talent. Yeah, no doubt about it. Because they had Newby and Wilbon and Taylor and... 
maybe there was another one in there. Was, he, they did not get a Zigbo. That was Reggie Davis who came in and got mm-hmm. a Zigbo right after he took the job. So, you know, I don't know. That's part of that's – honestly, that's part of the question. Now, he got Amani Cross. Amani Cross is a, was a good player. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I don't think he's a fit for what Mark Whipple wants to do. Mark Whipple wants guys that can catch in football. Right. Um, so that's probably where it's at with coaching. Um, I think they're going to end up in a, probably a decent spot. But I, I'm a big believer that the offensive line and the running backs room need to get a heck of a lot better real quick. So when they added Hunter Anthony, and they you know they have Kevin Williams now they're going after this JD Dorenzo. When Hunter Norzad left Nebraska out of its top five. Um, there's a couple other interesting names in the transfer portal. It's hard for me to tell if this guy that was at SMU that was recruited by Nebraska, Alan Ali, is actually in the portal or if he's going to the NFL. Um, there's some interesting options there. So, you know, like there's just – that piece has to get a lot better. Donovan Rill has a lot to do. And then whoever the running backs coach has a lot to do because those two positions just haven't been good enough um, – for Nebraska to, to really be able to protect their quarterback from getting injured and, and committing a bunch of turnovers. They've had to run the offense that they've been running because they cannot run the football just handing it off to a running back and having him gain yards. And when you can't do that, then all of a sudden it's like you push that, you know, you push the credit card. Well, I'm going to put this on the credit card called the quarterback. You do that enough times and the credit card hits its limit and the quarterback gets hurt or he has a game ending fumble how many times i mean nebraska lost to illinois this year because of a fumble they lost to michigan because of a fumble Mm -hmm. like you can't thump quarterback fumbles michigan state too was that a fumble late after the interception or was it an interception it was an interception turnover all right it was they all start to run together but no it's you don't you see what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like there's too many times when when you know the the credit card gets maxed out and you've got 400 yards and you've got 20 points and who does that help nobody so that's the thing that i think they've got to get a lot better at right and in in the bigger picture too uh there's still another signing day up ahead so you've got the portal activity which in theory will sort of curb within the next week or so as classes start and the motivation to to commit goes down you still got a handful of uh, junior college and high school players that they're in on as we've mentioned before, you only have to be at 88 total scholarships by early or by the traditional signing day in early February, and then down to 85 by fall camp. So there's still some attrition to be had, uh, probably this month, and then certainly after spring practices occur and players sort of have an idea of where they stand with things, there'll be another round of that there as well. Um, let's talk hoops. It's been an interesting week for for the men and the women. I mean, you've had the high of of the women beating and and just kind of pounding Trouncing, number yeah. eight Michigan at home uh Sam you could probably speak to that being maybe the, the most impressive win of the Amy Williams era um that was good and then on the other end of it the men while seemingly maybe playing better continue to to drop games against Ohio State and Michigan State um Sam, do you maybe want to set it up with the women first and kind of what sure. you saw and, 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 and what's, what is it about that program that, that has them rolling right now? For people who have been paying attention, they're 13-1 and one and they're 2-1 and one in the Big Ten. Uh, they play Iowa on Sunday. Iowa's good. They have one of the best players in the country in Caitlin Clark. On Tuesday night, Nebraska played Michigan, who also has one of the best players in the country in Naz Hillman. Nebraska dominated that game. Uh, it was the most dominant performance, I think, of the Amy Williams era. I do think that Michigan fits Nebraska's eye a little bit. Um, so I, I thought they had a real good shot of winning that game, and they did. Uh, they won by 21. Uh, and to set aside the dynamics of what makes the, like, you know, the, the on-court stuff, that's all fine. And they're, they're shooting the ball well, and they're getting good contributions, and they have, you know, all those. But the things that I think are portable – two other sports at Nebraska is that they have genuinely good chemistry and genuinely Mm -hmm. good chemistry is there's they're tough they hold each other accountable but there's there's real levity there's real fun there's a lot of laughs and a lot of smiles on that team which I think is encouraging Um, they have a genuine if you want to talk about the value of a five-star transfer Jazz Shelley is a five-star transfer 
She isn't referred to as that because she's from another country and she's not on any recruiting list, right? But she's a five-star transfer. She's part of the Australian national team at 19, 20. Um, she played next to Sabrina Ionescu at, at Oregon. That's kind of why she went there. One of the reasons she went there was to kind of be mentored by that player. And then she came to Nebraska because one of her best friends is here, Isabel Bourne, and so on and so forth. Well, this is, a, this is an elite, elite player. And so the value of having an elite, elite, five-star kind of player on your roster who also has a really good attitude is valuable. Imagine Bryce McGowan's two years down the road. So who he is now isn't who she is now because who she is now is a player that averages 12, 6, and 6. And that's a great basketball player. When you're doing those three things, when it's not 18, 3, and 1, or whatever Bryce averages, and it's 12, 6, and 6, that's how you know it's a really good player. And so Jazz Shelley is that. And then the genuine chemistry. So the thing that they got lucky on, and they didn't always have great chemistry, the thing they got lucky on or fortunate with is their freshman class is full of very extroverted, brassy, uh, out there kind of players who are funny and you know, big personalities, and that has benefited some of the older players who I would describe as not necessarily having that. Mm-hmm. The lead of that is Alexis Markowski, who is a you know a player from Lincoln Pius. Her dad, Andy, played at Nebraska. And she is, very, the Markowski family has very quickly become sort of the family of the, of the program. You know, Christmas, they're going over there, and that kind of thing. And Alexis just has a specific kind of personality where uh, she is, um, I don't know what, I don't know how to describe it. She's 19, 18, 19 years old, but she has a personality of a 25 year old. And it is, it's infectious to the team. So when she makes baskets, she flips out like every time. <laughs> but that, but that gets everybody else going. And then they have a 60-year senior in Michael Caton, who's probably going to become, I don't know, a lawyer someday or a coach. I mean, she's a pretty brilliant person. She doesn't play a lot, but she's a real vocal leader. And so she's, she controls a lot of the emotional energy on the bench and in the locker room by being who she is. And it's just rare to have all those pieces, and they have them. And good teams tend to have those kinds of things. Sometimes great teams are just really, really talented, Kentucky basketball, Nebraska Volleyball once had a team like that, where Sarah Pavin was there and the chemistry stunk. It wasn't any good, and they went all the way to the finals. <laughs> you yeah, know? It can happen. It yeah. happens because you're so stinking good. This team is more, you know, the sum is greater than the parts. And honestly, I think that's probably what the men's basketball program has to be one day, and I've, I know it's what football has to be because they're not going to be Georgia or Alabama. They're just not. Mm. It reminds me of, of baseball, too. I mean, just the, the big personalities and, and – I don't want to, you know, we're, we're not talking about baseball this for this coming season, but they lose a lot of big names. I mean, Spencer Schwellenbach was a big personality, big reason that that team was as good as it was. And it just, maybe it's too general to say it, but it feels like it's harder in, in this day and age to find those really extroverted personalities, those kids that everyone kind of wants to rally around in this era when it's just like, hey, you know, you do you, I want what's best for you, good luck in the portal, that kind of thing, like, when you can capture that sort of intangible quality, man, it right. it it goes so far, and it's so hard to to quantify. Um, you know, I, I wrote a, a baseball recruiting piece about how that's part of what they do is they look at the personalities of the guys too, and it's you know it's so deceiving to just look at hey you're a three star hey these are the stats they put up, but if you you know when you look at deeper stuff like how how do they compete on a play by play or game by game basis? Are they a leader? Um, do are other people drawn to you? Are you invested in the success of others like all that stuff there's just something about it that's part of the magic of sport where when you get enough personalities like that together man with talent of course cool things can happen that's a good point like to your point i know mojo haggy was always a culture guy and a glue guy and all those things what he couldn't be was the best player on the team and Mm -hmm. i think early in his career you know in the early in the erstad era he was almost being asked to do too much Mm -hmm. of of it now, when he became, what was he, a fifth-year senior or mm-hmm. fourth-year senior or whatever, he was in a perfect spot Like he, because Schwellenbach was there. They had better players, and so he was able to become what he was able to become. It's almost like, like in Nebraska football, 
you need a couple more guys to be really, really good football players so that player X isn't necessarily the best football player on that side of the football. Mm -hmm. They're a glue guy. They're not necessarily the guy that's that's glue and the guy that's got to go get 12 sacks, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. totally. When we were talking about when you were talking about jazz, Sam, the word that, that kept come, popping in my head, she's a connector, right? She's a connector mm -hmm. on the court. She makes things work for a, court, lot yeah, really for a lot of different for a lot of different people on the court, a lot yeah. of her teammates. She can help uh, raise their game, but also personality-wise, a lot of those freshmen that you were talking about, they're connectors in that they, they bring right. people together because they are so outward with their personalities. And the, the quote-unquote five-star transfer that, Nebraska was putting the eggs in the basket for this year was Alonzo Verge. Alonzo Verge was the guy. He wasn't a five-star. It wasn't his I, rating, but he was that guy. He was right. going to be lead ball handler. Everything operates around this guy. Heliocentric type of offense where one guy has the ball and sprays it out to a bunch of other guys, and then hopefully the, 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 the sum of the parts will be greater than the whole, like you were talking about there. And at Big Ten Media Day, he showcased that sort of extrovert personality, right? right. He was rocking the Louis Vuitton shades and the Jordan Fives and the right. Big Ten, like the Big Ten Media Day people, like the Big Ten media, it, the specific Big Ten office media people were loving it. Like the cameras followed him around. I wrote, this was right. a story I wrote. And the problem is he's not really that same kind of guy on the court. Um, I was reading, I, I just pulled this up while you guys were talking. I was reading like a mock draft. I just I'm just checking in on Bryce's mock draft status every yeah, now and again. Sure. And uh, the athletic guy, I think it was Sam Vecini who wrote this. He's good. Called at Lonzo Verge a Stacy Patton level black hole of basketball, <laughs> which I would I would deem wow. to be a bit harsh. You want to tell people who Stacy Patton is? I don't know who Stacy Patton okay. is, but I figured you guys would know the reference. No, you guys uh, don't know. Oh, I okay. don't know. Well, none of us do then. But it's it's bolded and linked and everything. So. The point is that Alonzo Verge doesn't pass the ball as often as people want. He dribbles a lot. He forces shots quite often. And now, that obviously, Fred recognized that. He sort of took responsibilities away from Alonzo yeah. in, that, in that regard, um, sort of trying to thrust it upon Derek Walker. Right. To mix results, Derek Walker is scoring super efficiently, but he has 15 turnovers since they've unveiled this. Uh, new look offense. He's never been this type of usage player before. He's never right. had to make this many decisions. It's clearly showing. Right. Um, and the but the other thing about Derek Walker is he is not that type of outward. You're not going to hear Derek Walker on the court. Like he, you know, he flexed once or twice against Ohio State. But even in interview settings, Derek Walker is very reserved and like he's yeah. the guy that Fred wants to be talking because he knows that that guy, that's the guy who's going to say the right thing all the time and. I think Derek gives good basketball insight when you ask him questions. He's honest, but he's not. He's not a. He's not a fun quote. Right. He's not a guy that that. Right. He's not. A, and this is not an indictment of him, but he doesn't light up a room. Right. He's just steady, and responsible, and you can rely on him. So there's a discon the right. disconnect between what you're talking about with the women's team and the men's team is. They thought they had the guy, and Alonzo Verge certainly has that personality. I mean, you rewatch you watch these games on TV. It's I think it's partially because Verge has such like a, a high octave, high pitched voice. But you hear him, you hey man, hey man, yeah, foul, like stuff like that. Like come right. on guys, like he talks, and you right. can hear him. Derek He's, Walker, even if he raises his voice, you're not going to hear him. It's not it's not the same thing, and they're just there's the, the disconnect is there. With the parallel you're drawing there, Sam, it's. What the women have, the men don't, right. because they have too many, I think, sort of uh, hand-picked toys from different areas, and they don't have they don't have the same foundation. They don't have the same type of connectors. They don't have the same people who are um, willing to play the same sort of style that that Fred has envisioned, or they haven't they haven't uh, done it so far. Like, do the men have fun in your experience? Like, I know it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing because if you're not winning, it's not as fun either. But like, I'll say this: I found it, I found it novel, and part of this is because they're losing a lot, right? But it was novel for me to see guys like Eduardo Andre at the end of Ohio State game didn't sit at, on. He was on the bench for the final three minutes of, the, of regulation in the Ohio State game. He didn't sit down for the entire for the entire three minutes, and the bench was like freaking out after every basket. We just haven't seen that very often. Um, Derek, the Derek Walker like flexing. We we haven't seen that very often. There was 
a different energy in that game. Again, partially because it's a close game. They had a chance of winning it. It was an opportunity to upset a team that was ranked number 13 in the country. But it was just... It, f- it feels like at PBA, and it could be a chicken or the egg thing with the crowd because the crowd at times has been pretty fed up with the team, to be honest. It's just dead. Mm. It's just really quiet in there. And there's, I don't know, there's no pop. There's no pop in the crowd. There's no pop on the court. There's no pop in the ball. It's not moving. It's just, and then you get where it peaks is when you get these moments where, um, uh, I'm not gonna. I'm trying not to pick on Bryce, but Bryce does this once a game. Once a game, Bryce McGowan takes a butt ugly pull up three pointer. It is ter- like he did it last night against Michigan State, where he's just like, "All right, you passed me the ball. I'm gonna look at. I'm gonna evaluate my options, and I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna shoot it. There's no rhythm to the shot. It's not likely to go in. Of, of course, he thinks it's going in. Everyone, every basketball player is very confident all their shots are gonna go in. But everyone in the gym knows that's probably not going in. But he's taking it, and. Fred throws his hands up and, you know, he's starting to take guys out for it more often. But that stuff just, it just sucks the energy out. Hmm. It's just not that part. I do think there have been stretches where they have had fun. Certainly during the Colorado game, that looked fun. Opening night, that looked fun. All that stuff, preseason, that that stuff, we have not even really approached that ever again. But there are just a, a lot of moments like that where they, you know, the, whether it's a verge forcing a floater or there have been two separate times, and I'm not saying this means anything, but once against Indiana, Kobe Webster, at the, toward the end of the game, had the ball in his hands, and Alonzo Verge was like sort of open in the corner, jumping up and down, didn't even get a look. Last night, um, two separate occasions, C.J. Wilcher cuts baseline. Bryce, instead of – C.J. Wilcher's very open and like one pass away from Bryce. You can, you can see that. Bryce takes a running one-footer. <laughs> Instead of throwing to CJ, yeah, and then late in the game again, I think it, I think it was Bryce this time who had the ball. Alonzo cuts from the corner, is open for two seconds, three seconds. Again, jumps around. Bryce, it's it's tough because Bryce sort of drives into his defender as Alonzo's cutting. So I'm not saying Bryce, Bryce has done a lot of good things with the ball in his hands as a playmaker this year, but against Ohio State, he played really well. Yes, but. Th- those are just that kind of stuff. You, if you miss an open teammate or you take a really bad shot or th- the combination of the two, that sucks the fun out of it sure. because that's not what it's supposed to look like. I hear you. Mm. Uh, speaking of chicken and egg, is it the defense like, or the offense that, that, that starts the problems? Because in the last three games against Big Ten teams, here is the effective field goal rate that Nebraska's allowed. 61.2, 60.3, I don't I don't know how many teams Nebraska's going to beat doing that. Right. Like I understand that you know cuz Fred said it last night and it was in your game story. The shots stopped falling right. and there was a scoring drought. Duly noted. However, you're giving up 61.2, 60.3 and 58.9. You can't a t- an opposing team can't hit 16 three-pointers and you ever expect to win. Unless it's Nebraska, Kansas in 03, which is exactly what happened. I've been weighing that. I think it's honestly, Sam, I think it's that this roster was built to be an awesome offensive team and a defensive team that was good enough to get by. Mm-hmm. You're going to make a bunch of threes and you're going to make so many threes that you, you can't you can't help in, on those drives where Verge is, is able to get by a lot of guards, even still in the Big Ten. Right. And you'll score a bunch of points and the defense will be good enough to get by. Right. And then you take away Trey McGowan's, who was by far the best defensive player on the team for six weeks. That doesn't help either. So I think it was, I don't know if this team was ever built to be an awesome defensive team. The problem is that they're actually still a better defensive team than they are an offensive team. How many points do they need to score to, to beat teams? In the Big Ten, I would say, I mean, you got to hit 70. Because there's some fire, not only is there firepower in the Big Ten, but there are a lot of good defensive teams right. in Big Ten. Like the the number the defensive like people are talking about how Purdue's defense is struggling right now and it is. It's like plummeting in the defensive rankings and they're I think they're ninth in the Big Ten in scoring defense right now. <laughs> Purdue's still like a top sixty scoring defense right. in the country. Like they are the 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 standard for defense in the Big Ten is just like it's just like football. It's like football where we had, you know, Nebraska was, I don't know, the top at one point, they were like a top 25 scoring defense in the country this year, and yet they, they were like six in the Big Ten because that's just the style that it was. Um, so, yeah, I think 70 is a good benchmark to try and hit. 
and they're they're not getting there often enough. What what do you see in the next month that's like worth dialing in on? I mean, because we, the schedule's hellacious. Sam Sam and I were on the phone yesterday, and he was sort of gently reminding me that like, hey, he, he asked me what's my Michigan State advance going to be about, and it's like, well, you know, transition defense, they have to get back, blah blah blah. And he was like, well, look, that's all well and good, but we have to start thinking bigger picture. Like mm. they might be. <laughs> They might be 0-4 in Big Ten. They're, I think they're 5-38 and 38 in Big Ten play since Fred Hoiberg got there. That's what we're watching for now. I mean, they just lost, again, they're 38, they've lost 38 of 43 Big Ten games mm. under Hoiberg since he got here. There's Rutgers on Saturday, who is on Nebraska's level, but has beaten Purdue and, like, has, has real players. No one should, like, Nebraska is not, I think the Ken Palm projections don't have Nebraska favored to win a single game the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. And after Rutgers, it's Illinois who's getting it together. They're shooting, I think they have the, like the eighth highest three-point percentage in the country around Kofi Coburn. Then it's Purdue, machine. Then it's Indiana. Then it's Ohio State again. There are not any guarantee, not even, there are not, I think, I would venture to guess Nebraska will be, Indiana games at home, so that one won't be as bad, but Nebraska will be at least a five-point underdog in every single one of those games. Purdue's on the road. Purdue is on the road, I believe. Yeah, that's tough. It's, I don't think Nebraska's beat Purdue since they joined the Big Ten on the road. It is. They've beaten so. them at home four or five times. That's what we're watching for is that they just need to win a game. They've ever beaten the, them Because, like, there have been the displeasure with Hoiberg right now is, I would say, it's at slightly higher than a murmur when we're <laughs> talking about job status. Yeah. It's going to get real loud if they lose on Saturday at Rutgers and then do what everyone thinks they're going to do in that next stretch. So that's what we're watching for going forward is mm. can they like on a on a micro level they are playing better right now. They did look their energy has been better. They've been get putting forth more effort. Like the Michigan State and Ohio State games, I think if they played those 2 weeks ago could have been really ugly. But on a macro level, you just have to show something. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's going to get really ugly. Yeah, and we'll talk more about let's see what happens against Rutgers. Yeah, we'll be back next Tuesday I think to do a podcast. We'll talk more about the contract then. Go we'll have more on it. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, nobody thought this was going to be easy. Maybe people did think it was going to be easy with Fred, but nobody thought it was going to be easy. I mean, it, and it just didn't. There was no. I mean, I don't. I don't know how much they've. Last year's team was. I think. I think Fred would tell you he liked things about last year's team that got blown up because of COVID. Mm-hmm. They liked having Delano Banton on the team. Delano mm-hmm. Banton was a was a was a chemistry guy. He was a lighthearted. I mean, positional size pers- for defense, too. But just, beyond that, he was just, he had a great personality. Yeah. And, yes, he was very good as a defensive rebounder. That's yeah. what he was good at. Yes. And the difference between him and Verge is, I don't know, six inches um, and different people. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a knock on Verge. I, I'm probably more like Alonzo Verge than I am with Alonzo Ben. So I get it. Um, and the other thing, you know, when it comes to somebody like comparing she- Jazz Shelley and Alonzo Verge, it, you know, Jazz plays on uh, plays on a a team that has that is hitting its three pointers. That's fair. Verge is it plays on a team that doesn't, and um, you know, Jazz has been Amy's been building toward this for a while. This is, I think, year six, and I think Fred Hoiberg and his staff would say this is year two for that. Maybe even year one and a half because of COVID. Um, because what they walked into was a crater and, um, you know, and the team they put together the first year was, was not good. It just wasn't, they weren't a good team. And I've, I've been keeping track of the if effective field goal rate for a long time. And I've shown this to Jimmy before, and nobody can see this on video or anything, but. If you go and look, and I'll show you this, this the gray is, ne- is, is, the, is the opponent, and the red is Nebraska. You see those giant gaps between the gray and the red early in the graph? That's year one. So They were horrible. I mean, they were, and they kind of stopped trying and all the other things. And then last year, you'll notice that the lines kind of get jumbled together. And then, unfortunately, in the, la- in the first four games this year, there's the gap again. Yeah. That's, pretty big. That's a big gap. And so they've got to close that real soon. Because otherwise, that you know they yeah. can play hard, but they're not going to win. Two things uh, before we get off the hoops topic. Number one, I don't know how much they fed into this before. The, just the preseason t- 
talk around this team. Just did them no favors. Nope, People picking them to make the tournament. Yeah, it didn't. And they picked themselves to make the tournament. I mean, they talked it up. Okay, and I mean, you, you can see. I mean, John Rothstein, who was one of the people who was driving the, the bandwagon for them, was the MC of their of their uh, opening night event. So, like, you could put two and two together on that one. But that that just did no one any favors. That was unnecessary. And I know they were trying to get some positive momentum going, but like there was plenty. Any like you had the great recruiting class. You had the first five star. Just let it happen. You put. I think they put unnecessary pressure. I'm not saying that's not why this happened, but you just didn't need to do that. The second thing is. Stacy Patton, uh, I remember now, is a basketball player from the movie Eddie, which is a movie where Whoopi Goldberg coaches the Knicks. That's right, Frank and Eddie, Langella. Eddie Patton, oh, okay. uh, or Stacy Patton, does not pass the ball. Okay. That's what he does. He's a chucker. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you're right. The, the, we do this a lot with Nebraska sports. We, I think, sometimes because we want to put a positive spin on it, we we say they're going to be better than they are. They haven't proven anything yet. I honestly. I've tried really hard to stay away from, you know, I know I've just talked to Casey Thompson, but that's based on what he did at Texas. I've tried to stay away from talking up some of the coaches because I feel like, again, some of these new assistant coaches have been talked up already. Like they're, they're the, they're the best assistant coaches who have ever, who have ever been at Nebraska. And I, I don't, I, I don't know if it's because we do that because we feel like we have to because we need content to fill or whatever, but sometimes it just feels like it's too much. Well, to a certain extent, that's what, you know, Hope springs eternal, right? Sure. Every time you make a change, and you call people who know them, and then oh, right. I like that person, so I'm going to tell you that you know. Yeah, and like this is, and we are we are reporting, we are reporters, we are reporting yeah. what is said, and they're not going to say, yeah, I don't know about this guy. Yeah, that's, that's not it's not why I hire somebody. That's part of a larger conversation that we've had before about just the climate of Nebraska athletics in general, and and, and this comes up often. Is that is that unique to Nebraska though? I just think every time someone well, is new in a place, what's, what's they're going to get talked up. What's unique about Nebraska is that the college sports here are the thing. There's mm-hmm. no, you know, if you're if you're Purdue or if you're Indiana or whoever, and you struggle, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna hear some of it, but there are so many other things to distract people. Whereas this is the thing here, and so people do get fixated, I think, on it. And yeah, sometimes it it, it I'm sure bleeds down to the players and they feel that but at the same time that's just part of being at a, at a major college with major yeah. sports and major stakes and that's all right. that so it's a, it's a really unique place a couple things one it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal here if the assistant coaches didn't talk but they do so n- that makes it its story all its own two and i love listening to former players but there's a lot of former players who kind of because this is a good place to live remained in the market whether they, you know, they came here from somewhere else or they were born here, um, have remained in the market, and they're from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, and they remember when it was good, and so there's a kind of energy behind that. And then three, I think we overdo it with the players. I think I think that there's a certain bubble mindset of, like, and you see it happen not necessarily with quarterback. I think Adrian Martinez is a little different conversation there. I think it happens more often with certain positions where there's an impression of a guy that's that we think that that player is really really good and they're they're compared to the rest of the league they're not, and so sometimes we can get a little over our skis with with those things. I think the amount of expectation that was heaped on Sevian Morrison, for example, wasn't it wasn't fair. I mean, there was a lot put on that guy and. Um, Comparatively, Xavier Betts didn't have a lot of that because people weren't sure he was going to make grades to get to college. Mm-hmm. And so I think actually Xavier's gotten a pretty fair. But Omar Manning, the expectations for Omar Manning right. were. I'm trying to think of like over the last seven or eight years, who was the most hyped player, hyped recruit or addition? Who was that? I mean, he's right up there. How much of that is this that like if, if Omar Manning came from high school as like you're a typical four-star wide receiver as opposed to the top junior college. It's a little bit you know, different. It's different. Yes. it's different when you it put, like, different. this guy is the cream of That's whatever right. crop it is. Who cares? Right. He's the cream of that crop. That's right. Remember the yep. Tanner Lee buzz when he came yeah, in? Yeah, and that was too bad. Uh, now, now, I will say that we pushed back on that. I especially was like, this is unbelievable. They were saying he was going to throw for 35 touchdowns and he was going to throw for 4,000 yards. And I'm like, what in the world are you guys talking about? Um, you know, rarely in my in my time have I ever saw an athlete that matched up to the hype that I was told it was going to be. 
Micah Parsons was an, was an oh exception to the rule. He was unbelievable. Right? But, like, you know, Buki, mm. Tyjon yeah, Lindsay. Right. Like, yep. no. Yep. They weren't they weren't those guys. And I feel like we do we overdo it with the players, Jimmy. I think I think and I think it's gotten better, but if you go back three to five years, it was it, I don't think it was just, and just to add to that real quick, I I, I have felt um, I guess I've I've been more aware of that in the portal era because now guys leave and they've done nothing. I mean, Nadab Joseph just oh, left know. the program. And if you remember when he came in as part of that 2020 class, I mean, he was majorly touted as he was committed to Alabama and man, he's right. going to come in and, and make waves. And like anymore, it's just, it's, it feels silly oftentimes when these guys through no fault of their own necessarily are touted. And then in right. two years they move on and nothing's happened. And right. it's, there's just sort of that, that empty feeling there, but yeah, yeah. It, it can be ridiculous. At times. Randy Grigger is the other one who lived up to it. When he got here, he, they sent him home from the junior college. They're like, you need to go home because you're not going to make it to college. You're not going to make grades. So they sent him home, and he lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan with his parents, and he, he lived in their basement, and he had nowhere to go and nothing to do except his schoolwork. He lifted every day, and he ate fish, and I think he, he told me he drank like a, a liter or a gallon of milk every day, and he lifted. Nice. When this guy comes to Nebraska, and he got there, remember, late. I don't know if you remember this, but he got there in like the first day of camp. He wasn't there all summer. He, he gets there like the first day of camp. He wasn't even at fan day. Him and Malik Collins walk off the field, and I remember I called Thad Livingston, um, and I texted him first, and then I called him. And I remembered saying, "You got to, they, they've got these guys are unbelievable." And I never, I'd never done that before. And I'm like, Randy Gregory's unbelievable. And that first year, I think he had 14 sacks, 13 and a half sacks. He had some personal issues after that, but the only reason he came like that is he spent six months in his parents' basement, <laughs> eating fish and drinking milk and <laughs> doing nothing. And then when he got to campus, he was unbelievable, like from the first day. So, But rarely does a kid match up to the hype, and I think we could do a better job with the players. I think the coaching piece, when Scott Frost came back, I'm not going to apologize for that. That felt like a rebirth. That was a 20-year hire. Oh, yeah. We can't apologize for that. Like, the day he came back with a 300 former players and everybody up there and T.O., I'm like, this is finally, you know, that's how it felt. Mm. He can't apologize for that. And I hope he doesn't. He shouldn't. Um, it hasn't gone the way anybody expected, but to be there that day was pretty special. And so the hype that surrounded that, given the fact that he had an undefeated season at UCF, it was legit. It was fair. Mm. It just hasn't lived up to it. All right. We'll probably go out on that. Yeah. Keep it keep it short and, and you know, sweet, I suppose, to this point. Basketball is going to continue on. Recruiting won't stop. Baseball's only a couple weeks away from starting practice, so it's a fun time. Stay warm. We'll be back. Plenty to talk about. Thanks for listening.